The term venous thromboembolism refers to the formation of blood clots within veins. The embolism portion of the name comes from the fact that pieces of the thrombus can break off, becoming emboli. These are defined as pieces of material that travel in the blood and can cause blockage within blood vessels. Deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism are the two main conditions within this term. If we look at the anatomy of the circulation, we see that in normal circumstances, blood returns from the body via the venous system into the right atrium, then passes into the right ventricle and is pumped into the lungs via the pulmonary artery. Here, the blood is oxygenated and returns to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins, then into the left ventricle from where it is pumped into the aorta and around the body. In a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot will form that impedes the return of the venous flow. This causes increased pressure within the veins, leading then to the clinical picture. This happens most commonly in the veins of the leg, specifically the popliteal and femoral veins, but it can happen in the upper limbs as well. Parts of this thrombus can break off and travel along the venous system eventually reaching the right ventricle and being pumped into the pulmonary artery. This is known as a pulmonary embolism, which leads to two main problems. The first is hypoxemia, meaning low levels of oxygen in the blood. This happens because the blood clot is preventing the blood from flowing to the areas of gas exchange and in response, the body tries to send more blood to other parts of the lung. This is called a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Shunting also contributes to hypoxemia and the ventilation perfusion mismatch. It can be intracardiac or intrapulmonary. Intracardiac causes can come from increased pressure in the right side of the heart due to the backflow of blood from the clot. This can cause blood to move from the right side to the left side of the heart. For example, through a patent foramen ovale. Intrapulmonary causes are where blood passes through the lungs without being oxygenated. For example, normally deoxygenated blood enters the capillaries from the pulmonary artery, then travels around the alveolus where gas exchange occurs and becomes oxygenated and then taken back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. If the alveolus is filled with fluid, then no gas exchange can occur. In a pulmonary embolism, areas of the lung can become ischemic, leading to no gas exchange and therefore is a form of intrapulmonary shunting. The second problem involves hemodynamics. Normally, the right ventricle is thin-walled compared to the left ventricle as it pumps against smaller pressures. But an embolus in the proximal pulmonary artery increases the pressure within the pulmonary artery, which is essentially the afterload of the right ventricle. The right ventricle cannot cope with the increased pressure, and so it begins to dilate, which stretches the thin walls and impairs coronary perfusion of the right ventricle. This causes ischemia and right ventricular failure. The dilation can also impair the left ventricle, ultimately leading to cardiac output dropping and hypotension. The risk factors for venous thromboembolism are summed up in Verkhoff's triad. They include blood stasis, hypercoagulability, and vascular injury. Blood stasis can come from immobilization following surgery or a long flight, and varicose veins can also lead to blood stasis. Atrial fibrillation is also an example, but this is unlikely to cause a pulmonary embolism unless there is a direct connection between the left and right sides of the heart. Hypercoagulable states can include pregnancy, as the body tries to reduce the risk of bleeding, cancer and genetic conditions like factor V Leiden and acquired thrombophilia like antiphospholipid syndrome are also examples. Use of estrogens also causes hypercoagulability. These include hormone replacement therapy and contraceptives. Vascular injury can come from direct contact like procedures or trauma, but also chemical injury like smoking. 
obesity also plays a role in each of these. As we mentioned, the most common cause of a pulmonary embolism is a clot moving through the venous system from a deep vein thrombosis in the proximal veins of the leg. But other emboli could be air or fat, for example following breaking a large bone. As we touched on with atrial fibrillation, it could be a clot moving from the arterial circulation via a defect in the septum of the heart. Signs and symptoms of deep vein thrombosis include swelling of the affected limb, typically unilaterally, redness or skin discoloration, tenderness or pain that is often described as cramping in the thigh or calf, and warmth of the limb. Pulmonary embolism typically presents acutely, with dyspnea, meaning shortness of breath, tachypnea, meaning a higher respiratory rate, and chest pain, often described as being pleuritic, which means that it worsens with breathing. This is in fact more common in smaller emboli that make it to the periphery, because they're more likely to cause infarction of that part of the lung. Hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood, is another finding, and pulmonary embolism can also be a cause of sudden cardiac death. A history and physical exam can give a suspicion of a venous thromboembolism. The physical exam can detect the clinical features we mentioned for deep vein thrombosis, and if pleural effusion has been generated by a pulmonary embolism, you may detect reduced breath sounds or crackles. Also, features of an impaired right ventricle can include a raised jugular venous pressure. A low-grade fever is also common. The WELL score is used for both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism to estimate the likelihood of the pathology. However, these alone are not usually enough to diagnose a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. Often more tests are required. Lab investigations include a D-dimer, which is a breakdown product of fibrin, the main component of a thrombus. In cases of venous thromboembolism, there are high levels of D-dimer as fibrinolysis is activated to break down the thrombus. D-dimer is highly sensitive but has poor specificity. This means that D-dimer can be high for other reasons, but if it is low, then a pulmonary embolism is unlikely. Imaging typically involves an ultrasound to assess the presence of a deep vein thrombosis, looking at features such as the compressibility of the deep veins. CT pulmonary angiograms are used to look at the perfusion of the pulmonary arteries. Less commonly, ventilation perfusion scanning is used, which would show part of the lung being well ventilated, but poorly perfused due to the embolus. Echocardiography can also be done to evaluate the degree of the right ventricular dysfunction. An ECG is useful in helping to rule out a myocardial infarction as a cause if there is chest pain, but it can also suggest pulmonary embolism. Strain of the right side of the heart is the main finding, but can also present a right axis deviation and a right bundle branch block. The so-called classic ECG findings of pulmonary embolism are a large S wave in lead 1, a large Q wave in lead 3, and T wave inversions in lead 3, known as the S1, Q3, T3 pattern. The primary treatment for venous thromboembolism is the use of anticoagulation, most commonly the use of warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist. Remember, warfarin does not work instantly. Therefore, initially, patients may use subcutaneous injections of low molecular weight heparin as a bridge until the warfarin is effective. More recently, direct oral anticoagulants have been introduced, such as rivaroxaban and apixaban, and are becoming preferred to warfarin, especially in deep vein thrombosis. Patients will often need to remain on the anticoagulation for a minimum of three months, and high-risk patients may need to take the anticoagulation for life. In cases of instability due to a massive pulmonary embolism, defined as shock or systolic blood pressure below 90 millimeters of mercury, thrombolysis may be indicated, with agents like streptokinase or recombinant tissue plasminogen activator,
Recurrent episodes of venous thromboembolism, despite anticoagulation, or a contraindication to anticoagulation, may require an inferior vena cava filter, which is designed to prevent further emboli from travelling from a deep vein thrombosis into the pulmonary circulation.